There go the kids. I wonder if I could go with them. And <laughs> they look like they're going to have candy fun. Um, so I, this story is found in First Samuel, but I didn't write down the uh, chapter. So it's about David. Well, if this was a World War II movie, you'd say, smoke them if you got them. But I'm glad it's not a World War II movie, so we're not going to say that. Okay, anyway, David. Well, David figured out that Saul, the king, was definitely going to kill him. There was no more mystery about it. He was out to get him. He had just spoken with Jonathan, and Jonathan, Saul's son, told David to get out of Dodge. The sheriff was going to kill him. So David fled for his life. He stopped at a place called Nob, in OB. There's a place in, around Branson named Nob, isn't there? And if there's not, there ought to be. Huh? Chapter 21. Thank you. I, I didn't write it down. So 1 Samuel, chapter 21. Thank you. So he went to Nob, and there was a priest of God there named Ahimelech. Well, David was by himself, and the priest, that alarmed the priest a little bit, because David was a mighty warrior, a general in Saul's army, a big guy, and he didn't go anywhere without soldiers. He was by himself. And the priest said, what's wrong? What's going on? And he said, well, I'm on a special mission. Uh, my companions will meet me in another place. David did a lot of things. <laughs> And David wasn't above stretching the tooth a little bit. It's not a good thing. It's just who David was. David did a lot of things. But one thing that he did do was he loved God. And he had a hunger for God. And he pursued God all his life. But the Bible shows all of it. It showed all the things he did and all the failures he had. But it also showed that he loved God. It encourages me. I, you know, we've all had times when we fall flat on our face or do the wrong thing. But God still loves us and he responds to our love. Well, anyway, he said to the priest, I'm hungry. Do you have anything to eat? And the priest said, all I have is the consecrated bread. Every day they would bake loaves and put them hot in front of the altar uh, or the place of worship for God and leave them there for the day. That was what the law commanded. And every day they would take the loaves that had been there yesterday and take them out, and those were for the priest and his family to eat. And the priest said, all I have is the, the consecrated bread, the bread of the presence. And he said, but I'll give it to you. But he said, are you and your men consecrated? Have you been away from women? And David said, oh yes, oh yes, of course. Anytime we're on a mission, we're away from women. And whether or not that was true, the Bible doesn't say, but the priest gave him the bread, and he took it, and he said, do you have a sword or a shield or a spear or something around here? And the priest said, well, over there behind the place we worship is the sword of Goliath, who David had slain. And David said, oh, let me have it. There's no sword like it. He took the sword, and he took the bread, and went and found his companions. Well, this story is the one that Jesus talked about over in Luke 6. Luke 6, 1 through 5. So Jesus and his disciples were traveling and walking through a grain field. And the disciples were picking heads of grain and rubbing them between their hands and eating the kernels. And there were some Pharisees with them. And they said, why are your disciples doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered with this story about David. And he said, don't you remember the story about David, how he ate the bread that was lawful only 
for the priests to eat. And he said, you see, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And he said, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus healed many people on the Sabbath. There are 15 or 16 times in the four Gospels that it specifically says on the Sabbath, Jesus healed people. I think he clearly made it known that healing people on the Sabbath was a good thing. Or as he put it, doing good was a good thing to do on the Sabbath. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, the Jews of the time, lived under a situation that they kind of devised, that there were certain things and rules and laws that if they kept those things, if they checked the boxes, they were good. Then they could do whatever they wanted to do, think whatever they wanted to do, believe whatever they wanted to do, but they kept these certain things. Well, that's not exactly what God had in mind or Moses had in mind when he gave them the law or wrote the Ten Commandments. But they had changed it to where they kept these certain rules and then they could live for themselves, continue their own agenda. There was no heart change. They kept the law superficially, really only to get by. And usually only when somebody was watching. God said in the prophets of these people, their hearts are far from me. Well, the keeping of the Sabbath in particular, as an example of the law, was a thing that was easy to see or judge if somebody was keeping it. They had rules about how far you could walk, if you could lift your arm, I'm making that up. But there were a lot of crazy little rules that they had made because that gave them the ability to do those things and then do whatever else they wanted to do on the side. And when somebody broke the Sabbath or broke one of their rules that they'd made up about the Sabbath, it was easy for them to jump all over them in self-righteous anger and prove how zealous they were for the law. So for those sorts of people, it's kind of scary when somebody comes along and actually keeps the real law and does it out of love for God. And we walked continually in fellowship with God. For those people who are trying to live under those rules and really don't really want to keep God kind of away from them, it's a little frightening for somebody to come along and prove that their system was worthless. Well, not only did he do that, but in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus completely reinterpreted the law. They had interpreted the law to be this real thing, that if they obeyed it, then they could do whatever they wanted. Jesus came along and reinterpreted the law clear the other way to say, you must have a heart for God. These rules are to worship God. The Ten Commandments said, don't commit adultery. But Jesus said, if you look, look on a woman with lust, you've committed adultery. The, the Ten Commandments said, don't murder. But he said, if you look on your brother with hatred, You've murdered him in the eyes of God. Jesus took it to a whole new level. He was not just keeping rules and then go do what you want. There needed to be a heart change. This turned everything upside down. So for those Jewish rulers in power who had their neat little system, they concluded pretty early that Jesus needed to be destroyed. He was messing things up. Well, God wanted man to have a day of rest, a day to pause from scurrying about trying to make a living, from pursuing your own games, your own gains, to pause and reflect on God and his blessings. What we just did, we sang about his blessings. We thank God, we worship God. We paused for a moment and we thought about God. 
God wanted that for the people. That's why Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's not about keeping rules. It's about pausing and knowing God, about hearing from him, about worshiping him. A day of thanksgiving, a day of rest. But the legalists made it a day for not doing anything. But they did it so that they could think whatever they wanted, pursue whatever they wanted. I talked a little bit about this last night at our concert, but it's like if you put a kid in the corner and tell him he's not going to play baseball today, you may keep him from playing baseball, but you won't keep him from thinking about it. He'll be playing it in his mind, in his heart. You can put me over here with rules, but my heart needs to change. This idea has creeped into Christian circles over the years. We, we meet on Sunday. I don't know if anybody told you, but that's not the Sabbath. It's the first day, not the seventh day. We think that if we show up at church, we dress up, not here, <laughs> other churches, <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> we think we dress up, behave, go to church, be nice to people on Sunday, except to our waitress, of course. Kidding. Then we can do whatever we want to do the rest of the week. A lot of people think that. They may not admit it, but that's the way they act. That's the way they think. I'll put on my suit. I'll go and I'll be good for a couple of hours. And then I'm out of here. But we, who know Jesus, who are newborn, who are new creation, the righteousness of God in Christ is in us. His love is shed abroad in our hearts. Every day is our Sabbath. Every day is devoted to God. We sang it today. Today is the day the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. That's true tomorrow. That's true on Wednesday and Thursday. Today is the day the Lord has made. Well, even in Jewish laws on the Sabbath, the priests and the rabbis worked on the Sabbath. Somebody had to slaughter those sheep. Somebody had to start the fire. Somebody had to lead the service. Somebody had to lead the choir. They were working. But they were excused. Well, we are members of a royal priesthood. We are priests to God. And we minister the good news of Jesus every day, carrying the message of God's reconciliation to all people. We are ministers of the new covenant. It's easy to get caught up in legalism. You get a little tired, you get a little weary and well-doing, and you think, well, if I just do this one thing, maybe God will leave me alone. If I just do this, maybe I can hide a little bit. I think legalism is a way to hide from God. I think Adam in the garden may have been the first one to practice this. Adam, where are you? Why did you hide from me? He said, well, we're naked. Being naked wasn't their problem. Disobeying God, rebellion was their problem. Legalists make up one rule to hide from the other, the real thing. Obfuscate, that's my favorite word of the week. They were obscuring the picture. Don't get caught up in trying to do just enough to get by with God. Well, I go to church. Well, I listen to Christian Station on my radio. Paul says the only thing that counts is a new creation. 
a change of heart. Last week, we read Ezekiel where it says, he takes out your stony heart and gives you a new one. When we give our lives to God, all of us, spirit, soul, and body, then he puts his spirit into us and we become a new creation, born again. He gave all of himself to make it possible for this new birth. He laid down his life for us so that we might, that we might live, and we must give him all of us. Well, meanwhile, back at Romans 12, in the first verse, he said, I implore you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual or reasonable act of worship. Reasonable. To put your body on the altar, to give it up to God completely. That's the reasonable form of worship. That's not overabundant worship, not extravagant worship, not crazy worship. It's just reasonable. It's just the normal part of worship. And the new version says on spiritual worship. The only way to get your flesh or your body up on the altar is when your newborn spirit is in control of your body, control of your flesh, in control of your desires. He goes on to say, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's easy to be conformed to the world and its mindset and its way of thinking. We're bombarded. TV, billboards, magazines, papers, radio. The message is God is dead, do whatever you want to do. It's all about you. But be transformed, changed. How? By renewing your mind. The prophet said, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. How do we get knowledge? How do we change our mind? By reading, by learning, by meditating on God's word. By learning the commandments of the new covenant. We talked about them last week. There's a couple of them. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God and love one another even as I have loved you. You do that, you got all the Ten Commandments and every other thing that Moses wrote. Love one another. Sounds simple. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do. To lay down your life on the altar, walk in love, walk in the Spirit, saying the same thing. Renewing your mind means to take control of your thoughts by understanding God's Word and the power of the Spirit. Over in 2 Corinthians 10, Paul says we don't wage war as the world does. We don't think like they think. We are not conformed to the world, but we wage war according to the Spirit. The weapons we fight with are not like the world's weapons. On the contrary, our weapons have divine power. They are mighty to the tearing down of strongholds. Strongholds were like a fortress in the old days when all you had were bow and arrows and swords. A stronghold was a tough place to take. As we renew our minds, there may be strongholds that we have to deal with things in our mind, in our heart. Strongholds like doubt, stronghold of fear, lust, greed, hatred. Sometimes those strongholds just won't go away without prayer, without the power of the Spirit, without walking in love. But the weapons that we have can demolish any of those strongholds. What are our weapons? 
the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, and the Word of our testimony. We demolish arguments or excuses and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is what we need. That's what we contend for. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Sometimes our thoughts come from our, inside us, from our own lust, from our own greed, from our own fear, from our own doubt. Sometimes they come from the enemy. But it doesn't matter. We take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Ever been terrorized by thoughts? Ever woken up in the night, heard a noise? I've had times when I've woken up and it must be Satan saying something right out of the blue that's just a flat out lie that if I believed it, I'd be very fearful. But I tell him, no, I belong to Jesus. But he'll try. So if there are thoughts, you have to take, take them under control. You have to take them captive and take them to the cross of Christ and leave them there. And the best way to do that is to know the Word of God, to know who you are, to know that His love is shed abroad in your heart, that you are the righteousness of God in Christ, that you are a new creation, that you are born again, that God's not counting your sins against you. He is reconciled to you. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love and power and a sound mind. Those things have to be in you. You have to know them. And you know them by reading and learning them, memorizing them. Let them fill your mind and your heart. When Jesus was tempted by Satan and took him up on the mountain and did all the things to him, Satan wanted to argue, wanted to twist the word of God, but Jesus responded to him every time, it is written. It is written. It is written. The word of God is food and life to our spirits. Feed on it continually. How often do you eat food every day? Yeah, it depends on the day, I guess, but at least once, probably. How many times, Casey? Four. Four. I used to be like that. <laughs> Watch out. How often do you eat food? Feed your spirit more than you feed your body. Feed your spirit with the Word of God and let it grow stronger. It'll renew your mind and it'll give your spirit authority over your flesh and over those desires that seem to trip us up. Feed on it continually. Fill your mind with God's promises and turn away from the world's lusts and attractions and take every thought captive. <clears throat> the song said, turn your eyes on Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth we were strangely dim. We need to be a little more heavenly minded. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus to take my place on the cross, to die so that I could live. I thank you that he's here with us. I thank you for your spirit in our hearts. I thank you that we're born again, that we are new creations. The old is gone and the new has come. I thank you, Father, that you are at work in our lives to bring us to the place you want us to be. Father, we submit ourselves to you. We give ourselves to you in the name of Jesus. 
Bless us as we go. We commit our lives to you in Jesus' name. Amen.